All right, and continuing our introduction to, to vector logo design, we go to proving ground number two. This is all in unit nine. Remember that it has question of the day three, which is suggested to be due by midnight tonight, right? You can submit it later, but it's good to remind yourself of these differences as you're sketching, because you'll remember what is it about vectors that are different than raster and what are they good for that raster pixel based images aren't good for and i have these slides this video comes from our, our introduction to the class video created by a past student but just this little frame that it's using to start the video is notes on this so vectors versus it says bitmaps but that's an old name for raster Vectors are what you need when you want your imagery to be really clean, like perfectly clean curves, lines, uh, flat colors, simple shapes. So perfect for things like road signs, for logos, for t-shirt graphics, for embroidery designs, for things that are going to be turned into fiesta metals, things that have to be perfectly rendered, right? Limited in color, which means you're not going to have really a great support for full spectrum of gradients. You're not going to have the millions of colors or even the 256 colors for GIFs in most vector design. Instead, it's very simplified color. And then most of all, you use vectors when the file, the digital file you create, needs to be infinitely scalable. It needs to be able to be used for a business card and the side of a truck and the size of a billboard, right? And embroidered onto a hat. You know, that can all be from one vector file. Where do you, when do you want to use raster images? Well, they're good for lots of detail, like individual hairs on a creature's back, right? Being able to control the pixel resolution on that helps for subtlety in color and shifts of color, gradients, smooth transitions, being able to control the color of every pixel and control how tight that pixel grid is really helps desktop icons like these better that these are pixel based because if they're vectors then they have to get down sampled and then shown as pixel based because they're made for screen icons anyway so that a vector actually takes more memory as a screen icon than a raster image does and then things like photographs if you can turn a photograph into a vector but you're not going to like how it looks it looks like a really chunky stencil what file does a vector so there's a few different formats for vectors that we haven't learned yet. But let's review what we've learned. We'll do it as review for the midterm. But what have we learned for raster files? We've used them as JPEGs. That's our simplest online raster file format. We've done them as PNGs, which are raster file formats that go online and support transparency. And then our working raster file format is PSD, which stands for Photoshop document, whether we're doing it with PhotoP or with Photoshop. That takes up the most memory, it can't go online, but that gives us all of the control, all the layers, all the different settings. So those are the raster formats we've done so far. Oh, we also did GIF, right? GIF is an online file format that limits your raster image to 256 pixels, but because it's so limited, it also supports animation scripts that play in browsers. And GIFs support transparency. Whew, but a GIF is not a multi-layered format. It can only show one layer at a time. So that's, those are the, the file types that raster we've done. The vector file types we're going to learn are SVG, EPS, and then AI if we do it in Adobe Illustrator. So SVG is the most standard. It it's, stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. EPS is my favorite. And that's another portable vector format type. And then AI is the Adobe specific vector format type, working format for Adobe Illustrator. SVG, EPS, and AI. All right. Quick reminder, what is the difference between them? Vectors, perfectly clean at any scale, will always give you the best result. If you're looking for clean shapes, right? Great for t-shirt designs like this. Great for logos. Great for mascots. Great for line art illustrations. Like Vector can do this very well. We'll be doing this with a later 
assignment. We'll be making line art as a vector and then coloring it in with raster. When you do it pixel-based as a raster image, you can have differences in different line qualities. Like some of you, when you were compositing your landscapes, one mountain was sharper than another mountain, right? Because of the different resolutions. That's because they're not scalable. They're always locked into their pixel dimension. So vectors will not only always be clean at any size, but they'll always relate to internally to each other perfectly. So raster imaging is used when you really need to limit memory, like 8-bit imagery in early Atari games and arcade games, like Mario when he first showed up in Donkey Kong. That's an 8-bit pixel design, which basically means you have to make the use of your memory as efficiently as possible. So every square pixel is used as a square, and that makes a difference for every sprite. But you just go up about 30 years from the design of that, and you get to vector design of characters for two dimensions. This is, I think, for Paper Mario. And this is outlined with a vector and then colored with raster imagery. And that means that that same character now can transcend any, any screen resolution, you know, whether it's an Atari screen, whether it's a 4K television, and it will always be perfectly clean. So this is obviously better for the line art and for the character design than this. But it does take up more memory. When it gets complicated is when you have vector 3D models that then will render out for 2D their own outlines. So these are vector outlines rendered from a 3D polygon mesh. Because 3D polygon meshes are vectors. But then the meshes, the individual polygons, get filled in with raster pixels to become what are called uh, rendered models. So when you render a model, you're filling in the pixels. And that can be done multiple ways, which we'll be learning, right? In two dimensions, anyway. Flat color, duotone color, soft edge duotone. So what we are designing are pictorial logos. We are not trying to to work with letter forms. And we're not trying to do both at once. So if you're working on combined marks that have imagery and letter forms, just get rid of the letters. And let's just focus on the, the pictorial aspect of the logo. But no matter what you do, you want these to be clear, engaging, and versatile. So they need to work at any scale. They need to be perfectly clear in their communication. And you want them to be engaging by just not being super cliche and super generic. These three approaches are helpful at pushing your idea, right? Central symmetrical is, is probably by far the most common. And it's not always perfect symmetry, but it's always based in the middle and then balances out. And so we're always going to design it in black shapes first. So this was my sketch for central symmetrical in these slides, right? Dynamic can be tricky for people, especially if they're new to logo design, but the whole idea is that it is not based on horizontals and verticals, it's based on curves and diagonals. It's meant to move the eye through it at speed, sometimes through it and around it, like this Rio de Janeiro Olympics logo, which is one of my favorite Olympics logos. And all it takes is kind of shifting it, curving it, putting in a diagonal, what you want to avoid are horizontals and verticals. And then positive and negative space, sometimes they're central symmetrical, sometimes they're more dynamic. But this, what this really does is it activates the blank space. It makes the blank space vital to the logo. Even creating its own content sometimes, like the faces here, the animals here, the S here, the city skyline here. So for my dynamic, I just took the, the mascot head did it from the side and tried to have a lot of diagonals and curves, no horizontals and verticals. For the positive negative space, I did one big shape and then cut out of it with this other content in the negative space. But let's look at some professional examples. The theme that's suggested is a spirit animal. My favorite animal is an otter. I don't know if it's my spirit animal or not, but I just looked at some, some logos that exist for otters. For your ideas, you can always just Google search this thing logo like maybe an armadillo is your spirit animal so if i look up 
armadillo logo, even if I spell it wrong, <laughs> it will help me out. And I'll see a lot of versions, right? I'll see ones that are central symmetrical. I'll see ones that are trying to be more dynamic. If I'm lucky, I might even find some that play with positive and negative space. Because right? that's it's a fun way to play with it. Now, do I want you to copy any of these logos? I want you to be inspired by the ones that fit your taste and then modify them for your purpose, right? That's why I say logo slash tattoo, because I want you to like this simplified <coughs> spirit animal so much that you would tattoo it on your body. So I'm not doing an otter for my demo, because I, I traveled in, in Mexico this uh, holiday break, and I learned what my first initial would be and my birthday would be for the Mayan kind of catalog of, pic of pictographs. And mine is the feathered serpent, so that's what I'm going to do. But you can see here the otter is central symmetrical as dynamic based on curves and diagonals. And then here as a play of positive and negative space, sometimes just as simple as putting your thing on a circle and cutting it out of it is a play of positive and negative space. So then we're going to refine our sketch. And how do you refine your sketch? Well, you pick your favorite approach. So if this is my favorite approach, I clean it up, and then I fill it in with the black shapes where I want the black shapes to be. And I use this as my example, even though this is a little nitpicky to be a logo, because notice how different it is if I choose to fill in the black shapes differently. Like just with the eye, if I choose for the, the middle of the eye to be black instead of white, how much it kind of changes how it feels, right? So that's what I'm going to show you next. So for your proving ground number two, which is right after the examples, you will see proving ground number two. You'll see another link to those same slides that can get you helped. You'll get a little link to what thumbnail sketches are. The whole point of thumbnail sketches you try out ideas quickly. They do not fill up a page. Instead, you put several of them on one page, like the size of your thumbnail, maybe a little bit bigger. And we try these three different approaches. So here were mine. I'm doing this feathered serpent. And if I do a Google search for feathered serpent logo, I'm going to get a lot of kind of clip artish ones. But they might be interesting to me. Like I like how angular this is and it'll actually show me how that was built in illustrator it's kind of cool how these logo designers are putting things on or i'm going to find ones that are much more illustrative right maybe a little too fussy to be a logo so how can i show this to you how do you refine what makes sense so i actually did a logo design in the professional program adobe illustrator and I did it as tattoo design. So these are actually more tattoos than logos. So I did a, a masculine feathered serpent shedding its skin and a feminine feathered serpent shedding its skin. That's what I was thinking of. One could go on each upper arm, right? And why do these not make good logos, though they might make good tattoos? Well, when I zoom in, they're perfectly clean. That's why they're vectors, right? But logos have to be incredibly versatile in a way tattoo doesn't. Tattoo goes for one place of the body. But if I put this on a business card, look what happens. You lose all of that cool distinction, you know, <clears throat> subtlety in the, the shapes and the scales and the constellations and all of that. And really, what makes better sense as a logo is just a solid black silhouette of each one. Does that kind of make sense? So that's what I warn with this project in terms of overdrawing, putting in too many details. That's not what logos are good for. A logo is going to be better the simpler it is. That's going to make it more versatile. So if I look at my sketches, these are all trying to be based on just cutouts of black paper. And so you post your sketches, central symmetrical, dynamic, play a positive and negative space. And they can just be line art sketches like this, but then when you choose your approach, which I'm now going to do, because for your proving ground, you need to post your 
at least three sketches with these three different approaches, but then you also 